So good, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. So the title of my presentation is Regional Health Integration and Cooperation in the Philippines. So I authored this paper with Lyle, Mr. Lyle Casas, and this project was funded by UNESCO. So next slide, please. So there are three objectives of, of the paper or, or the presentation. So number one is to assess uh, the performance of the Philippine health system vis-a-vis -vis the ASEAN or our regional uh, neighbors. Second is to assess regional health integration and cooperation in the Philippines. And third is to identify areas in which um, health integration and cooperation uh, can be obtained. So next slide, please. So I just want to uh, describe first the framework of the study that we use. So the goal of any health system, as we know, is to basically improve your health outcomes, right, or your, your well-being. And health outcomes are largely driven by the ability of the population to access healthcare services, right? And the ability of people to access healthcare services is, um, is a function uh, of your health system, right? So the following are the building blocks of the health system. So there's your health human resources, uh, there's your health facilities or your health service delivery system, uh, your financing, health financing systems, um, your, your e-health system, etc. And, and the entry point of economic integration is actually affecting all these health system, health system building blocks. So next slide, please. So let's start first um, with health outcomes, because this is like the main outcomes that every health system should actually focus on, right? So Filipinos in general uh, are becoming healthier in recent decades, right? So if you look at infant mortality, it's one of the sensitive measure of population health, has improved in the last two to three decades. However, if you look at that improvement, infant mortality remains to be high, right? Uh, if you compare it to other ASEAN countries. Um, so um, IMR is still relatively high compared to our uh, um, our neighbors. So the slow improvement in health outcomes um, um, failed the country uh, from achieving many development targets in our SDGs. And if you don't, if you do not make any um, path-breaking interventions, we might fail again for the SDGs. So next slide, please. So um, to improve health outcomes, access to essential, high-quality um, healthcare services is very important or very critical, right? access to essential healthcare services remains to be a challenge um, or a problem in the Philippines. So if you look at the UHC, uh, UHC service coverage index, which is an indi uh, uh, which is an SDG indicator to measure uh, the country's progress towards UHC, um, the country is lagging behind in terms of providing access to essential healthcare services like for maternal and child health services, for infectious disease um, services and for NCD services. Right? You will see that the Philippines is actually lagging um, in providing these very essential uh, healthcare services. Next slide, please. So let's start uh, the first pillar, which is health facilities or health service delivery, right? So um, these are just snippets of some of the findings uh, and we'll not go through them, but if you wanna read the whole, uh, analysis, uh, you can actually just download the paper. Right? So health system must have adequate number of health facilities, right, or number of beds offering different types of, you know, health, uh, different types of health services, right. But however, the Philippines is actually uh, experiencing large scarcity of these types of health facilities, right. So for example, based on our GS analysis with uh, the Department of Health, about half of Filipinos do not have timely access to primary care health facilities such as rural health units or barangay health station. And if you look at uh, the of beds, right, the availability of bed is also um, is, is, is very limited. So we have only one bed per 1,000 population, which is actually comparable to a lot of sub-Saharan African countries or many low-income countries, right? So according to the Department of Health, um, the country needs additional 400,000 hospital beds to meet the population need uh, for, for inpatient care. So that translate around 2.7 beds per 1,000 population. Right? So no wonder that we, uh, during COVID, we are experiencing a lot of uh, problems with, with uh, inpatient care. Right? Next slide, please. 
So another important aspect of, of, of health system is your health human resources. So here the figure shows the availability of physicians compared to other ASEAN countries and, and the stock of physician is relatively low. Uh, I mean, uh, the, the density of, uh, of physician is relatively low if you compare it to, ASEAN, to our ASEAN neighbor. Um, and if you look at our report, we, 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 we tried to tease this out and provide more understanding about this scarcity. So we've um, discussed issues on maldistribution across provinces and across uh, uh, local governments um, and uh, across socioeconomic status. So um, in our analysis in the report, most of health wor workers are situated in urban areas. So for example, in the latest health facility survey of the Department of Health, like only 90% of rural health units or your primary care health facilities in the country have at least one medical doctor. And if you look at standards, like all rural health units or primary care health facilities should have, uh, should have um, uh, a physician. Right? So next slide, please. Another important pillar is health financing. So when you say health financing, it examines the country's level of health spending, um, including the type of sources. So it's not only the level of health spending, but also um, um, the source, right? So, so if, you, if you try to analyze the out of pocket, uh, if you try to examine the total health spending, more than half of um, the country's um, health spending um, is accounted for out of pocket. And out of pocket remains a major source of um, 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 health spending. So public spending or the government spending um, in the Philippines is one of the lowest in the ASEAN region. So for example, in, two, in 2018, public spending on health was around $50. So this is com considered low um, for a middle income country. Like for example, Thailand and Malaysia, th these two countries are lauded for their you know, um, 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 comprehensive UHC uh, programs, they're spending around $100, $150 per, day, uh, per, per capita. So the country's public spending on health was around 1.5% of GDP, which is significantly lower than Thailand, for example, or Vietnam or Malaysia, where they spend around like 4% to 5% of their health spending. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in the paper, there is also a, a, a a lengthy discussion about um, the preparedness um, of, of the country uh, uh, to disaster. So as you may know, the Philippines recorded uh, the greatest number of uh, disasters in the region, right? So around 34% of the recorded disaster in the region um, um, occurred in the Philippines. So hydrological and meteorological types of disasters are the more, most common uh, in the Philippines. Um, so preparedness during public health emergencies varies across ASEAN members, right? Um, uh, so we try to measure the preparedness or we try to understand the preparedness of the Philippines relative to our neighbors. So we look at the international health regulations, for example, of the WHO, um, uh, which monitors the capabilities of health system to detect, assess, and notify uh, public health risk and emergency of national and international concern, including, for example, pandemics or um, et cetera. So the, I, the, the IHR identified 13 core capabilities that countries need to, to be monitored. So in, in, in 2019, the Philippines only received an average score of 53% uh, in IHR, one of the poorest performing countries uh, next to Laos and Cambodia. Next slide. So um, the assessment of the health sector, um, um, there are more uh, in-depth analysis on the, uh, on, on the assessment of performance, but I will not go through them. Uh, you can, as, as I said, you can download the paper and read the details, but I just want to provide a summary, right? So in summary, um, the country's relatively uh, poor performance in improving health outcomes is, is a manifestation of the different health system challenges um, which reinforces, again, I said, the need to implement uh, major health reforms in addressing limited health facilities, health workers, and health financing inefficiency. So, um, and ASEAN member states recognize the importance of, of resilient and effective health systems. So um, if you look at most ASEAN states that have recognized 
and embrace um, universal health coverage as an important component of, of, of their political agenda. So the goal of universal health coverage is included in many. So, so okay, so I'll just make a brief summary, right? So, um, so in summary, the country's relatively poor performance in improving um, health outcome is a manifestation of the different health system challenges, um, which again, reinforces the need to implement health reforms in addressing limited health facilities, um, 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 limited health workers, and um, health financing inefficiencies, right? So as I've said, like ASEAN member states recognize the importance of resilient and efficient health systems. So most member states, including the Philippines, have embraced universal health coverage as an important component of the country's political agenda. So, so the goal of UHC is, is included in many regional and international um, 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 goals, um, including the SDGs and the post-2015 ASEAN health agenda. So next slide, please. So in the second part of my presentation, we examine uh, the intersection of economic integration and cooperation and the pursuit of UHC in the Philippines. So as we, as we know, there is a growing multilateral collaboration among ASEAN member states, which has led to the creation of the ASEAN Economic Community in 2015, which aims to facilitate trade and create single market and production base integrated into the global economy, right? So the push for economic integration and in the region uh, can argue, like arguably, uh, the, the, the push for economic integration in the region has profound impact on economic and social structures of countries, including, um, uh, including health systems. So it is therefore important to find the common ground between economic integration and cooperation with the overall overall health goals of the health system. So, as I've said in as I've said a while ago during the first part of the pre presentation, in identifying, um, in, in in finding this nexus, we've used this framework, um, um, the health system framework that's commonly used by WHO. So, in identifying the barriers in trade in health services and goods, we obtained um, we obtained it from key informant interviews and review from different documents of government. Um, 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 such as the Department of Health, Field Health, etc. So next slide, please. So just a brief background about trade in services and go goods related to health. So the World Trade Organization classifies trade in services into four modes and tried to relate that to health services, right? So the first one is cross-border movement of health transactions, right? So an example of that is uh, telemedicine or healthcare related BPO like um, medical transcriptionists. Um, the second mode is the consumption of health services outside your country, right? An example of this is medical tourism or medical education. Um, the third is uh, the third mode is commercial presence. An example to this is uh, foreign direct investments in hospitals or manufacturing and distribution of medical goods and products. Um, the fourth one is movement of health workers, like mobility of health workers um, 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 for training or for employment. Um, and of course, outside of this mode is the free trades of good and products such as medicine, medical equipment, devices, etc. Right. So in this paper, we've tried to elaborate, elaborate each and every mode. So we've identified the barriers of each. So next slide, please. Um, however, it's important to link again these modes with the general goals of health system, right? So, which is to improve, as I've said, health access and health outcomes, right? So, for example, um, the profound impact of trade in medical goods and pharmaceutical product um, of openness to trade would, is to facilitate access to essential healthcare uh, goods and, and healthcare, sorry, um, access to essential, you know, um, healthcare goods such as medicine or devices, right, at competitive prices. For tel uh, for telemedicine or cross-border movement of services, um, the idea here is to improve access to essential and specialized diagnostic care and services, right? So telemedicine should facilitate access to essential and specialized diagnostic care. 
for for medical tourism so the possible positive impact of that is um, it provides economic benefits including additional resources for health investments for fdi or foreign direct investments for health a uh, commercial presence um, of health facilities for example could generate resources for expanding and upgrading healthcare infrastructure and technologies and the last one for the mode four so the positive impact of that is uh, mobility of healthcare worker should contribute um, to the efficiency and uh, uh, product. I mean, uh, contributes to the efficient and productive use of health labor force and facilitate transfer of technical expertise and knowledge. So next slide, please. So majority. Uh, so 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 let's start with uh, trade in medical goods and products. So how does trade affects access to healthcare services? So the most obvious linkage in in the cons uh, the, the most um, obvious linkage of trade in uh, goods and trade in goods and and in 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 achieving health outcomes is actually uh, on the consumption side. So openness to trade could facilitate access to essential healthcare goods and providers at, uh, at a competitive price, right? So here you would see um, we, we tried to look at the um, the level of of, of trade of medical goods uh, um, in the Philippines vis-a-vis uh, -vis with, with, our, with, with our other countries. Like. So majority of the Philippine imports of medical related products come from the ASEAN region, while most of its exports go to other countries. For example, in 2019, value of imports from ASEAN to Philippines was around 1.3 billion. And this, is, um, and this is the highest compared to other regions. Right? So next slide, please. Um, I'll just skip this. This is just basically a time series of the imp uh, imported health, go uh, imp imported and exported health commodities in the Philippines, right? So next slide. So what are the implications to trade here, right? So, so here, uh, tariff and non-tariff measure restrict um, trade in medical goods and products. So, so if you look at the average tariff of health products was rather low in the Philippines. So this is actually very good, right? So the Philippines, um, um, also is part of the ASEAN trade in, in, in goods agreement or the ATIGA in which ASEAN member state commits to reduce tariff of almost uh, zero to five percent for, for most products, right? So so in in March 2020 under the Bayanihan Act or the Republic Act um, number 11469, the Philippine government exempted the importation of certain medical goods and supplies from all duties, taxes, and fees for three months. So, so these are some of the interventions during uh, during COVID um, to actually um, improve access to essential um, supplies and uh, and goods uh, during the pandemic. So, so so here what I'm discussing here are some of the tariff measures, but there are also other um, non-tariff measures or non-tariff bar barriers that actually restrict trade. Right. So I think a lot of my paid co colleagues have examined this. So you may want to check. Uh, on these studies on the non-trade barriers, and I think they've examined um, 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 uh, uh, they examined um, the, the health sector. Okay, next slide, please. So, um, another um, another example of cross-border supply. So we're not going to services. So another example is the cross-border supply of services. So again, this is mode one. So an example to this is outsourcing of medical transcription, uh, uh, outsourcing of, of, of services like a, such as medical transcription um, uh, services. I won't delve too much on this, um, but we recognize the, the growing industry and how the, the industry improves social welfare by increasing income and employment, but I will not go through, through. I, will not, I will not discuss this in detail. So next slide, please. So another important type of cross-border uh, uh, cross-border movement of services is telemedicine. So we're still in mode one. So what is telemedicine, right? So so the WHO defined uh, telemedicine as the delivery of healthcare services, where healthcare provider is distant uh, with the patient, and information and communication technology is used to delve, deliver um, or exchange of information needed for diagnosis or treatment. Or disease prevention, monitoring, and evaluation, et cetera, right, of, of your condition. So 
so telemedicine if you if you try to dissect this definition have different classification and form so for each classification of telemedicine um different um, services can be done so the most common form is teleconsultation where a patient sees healthcare consultation through various modes such as video conferencing mobile messaging apps through the use of internet and typically, the payment uh, will also done through online, right? Through various uh, payment modes or channels. So. so next slide, please. So in the Philippines, uh, the current state of telemedicine is still in the early stages, right? So um, the practice and conduct of medicine is not, telemedicine in the Philippines is not like, um, it's not yet highly institutionalized, um, despite um, many initiatives over the past, uh, I would say the past decade. So, but again, I think efforts were accelerated due to COVID-19 pandemic. I think that many of us uh, um, were forced to actually adopt telemedicine um, because of restrictions of mobility, cross-border travel, and the over overwhelmed healthcare system. Um, in fact, um, the Department of Health or PhilHealth has temporarily um, uh, release guidelines, uh, clinical practice guidelines uh, on the use of telemedicine um, in response to COVID-19. Right? Next slide, please. So these are some of the barriers. Um, when we talk about cross-border telemedicine, we need to think about the general climate of telemedicine in the country. So here are some of the um, issues that we've identified during uh, our review and, and, and key informant uh, interviews, right? So number one is the lack of regulatory framework, right? So the only government document, if you try to scan um, the, 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 the policies, right? The only government document before the pandemic related to e-health in the Philippines was the, the Philippine e-health strategic framework. But this one, I, I would say is very broad. Uh, I would say it's very aspirational. A document and a lot of the operational issues remain to be very vague, right? So the document examined both the front end or the use of e-health, like such as telemedicine, and the back end, such as infrastructure facilities, such as uh, such as the use of of electronic medical records. Um, so as I've said, these are very aspirational, and a lot of operational uh, issues. Uh, have yet to be identified, right? So um, in 2020, uh, uh, temporary guidelines set by the DOH, FDAs, and other medical societies um, were able to come up with a more detailed operational uh, de uh, guidelines, and, that's, and this is primarily driven by the COVID-19, right? So number one is the lack of regulatory framework. Another is actually an issue is the ambiguity of existing laws, right? So most of the regulations are interpreted to apply to the practice of healthcare providers, like um, um, physician and pharmacists. So, for example, um, if you look at the Pharmacy Act, it recognizes telepharmacy um, and allows services of a duly licensed pharmacist to be done online as long as there there is a licensed uh, physical uh, physical uh, pharmacy, right? However, if you look at the Medical Act, that is for physician. The practice of medicine is engaged only if the professional is physically examining the person. So there is um, ambiguity again in the in existing uh, existing law. So um, um, as a, uh, another important um, issue under this is the uh, foreign, for example, foreign uh, physicians or medical foreign medical uh, workers cannot practice in the Philippines, right? So any physician in the country with valid license can actually practice telemedicine. However, due to lack of national legislation specific to practice of foreign licensed physician, for example, only Filipino licensed physician can practice telemedicine to the patient residing in the Philippines, right? Uh, uh, another important issue is financing. So even if you have telemedicine, but there is no financing mechanism, I think PhilHealth is starting to cover, um, there is discussion about covering um, telemedicine, but in the past there is no um, specific law or um, policies on how do we finance um, 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 telemedicine. So um, another one, another issue is limitation in infrastructure such as untrained staff, high financial requirement of telemedicine, lack of ICT infrastructure and high speed internet, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So these are um, issues that are keep recurring in many interviews. So, so, so again, um, these things are, have large repercussions on the quality of care. So 
um, another important thing is that the medical education is not attuned to to electronic um, interactions um, during patient um, uh, provider inter, uh, interface. Next slide, please. So let, now let's go to mode two or consumption of health services abroad or medical tourism. So um, just just to give you a brief a background um, um, about or numbers about medical tourism. So in 2019, around 10,000 tourists visited the Philippines. If you look at the data from the, the Department of um, um, the Department of Tourism, around five percent of that um, are accounted from ASEAN neighbors. So, however, if you look at other data, like for example from uh, Oscar Picasso, um, uh, PIDS have received approximately out, around 80,000 um, uh, medical tourists in 2010. So there is actually large discrepancy, maybe because like we are not actually monitoring uh, medical tourists coming from the Philippines. So, so that's actually one of the major challenge if you if you if, uh, during key informant interview the lack of the lack of data, right? So in the Philippines, medical tourism um, revolves around 10 hospitals uh, accredited uh, by the Department of Tourism um, um, and three private hospitals accredited by an international accreditation body. So most of the medical tourists are actually uh, going into these facilities. So it revolves around these facilities. Next slide, please. So, um, so some of the barriers that we've no identified um, uh, during key informant interviews and reviews, so number one is inequity concerns. A lot of uh, decision makers um, are voicing their concerns on um, um, issues of inequity, that um, um, medical tourism that might lead to inequity. So um, a lot of decision makers perceive medical tourism to have negative and negative effects because it might lead to brain drain in public hospital systems. It also creates dual health systems, so it leads to more inefficient health system. Some have voiced out issues on medical inflation, and it can be highly regressive because of the lack of portability of health insurance, right? So um, another issue is regulatory ambiguity and limited capacity. So for example, there is you no know, clear delineations of the Department of Health or the Department of Tourism, which should, uh, I mean, we, we need to clearly identify the, the the roles of these both of these two agencies, right? And I've said there's also limited capacity. For example, in the Department of Health, like a small technical office um, in DUH handles medical tourism, um, but a stronger technical capacity is needed to set, for example, framework, directions, and standards of the industry um, is actually needed. So, um, yeah, so that's a, a very important issue that keep keeps coming in interviews on, 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 on the capacity of, of, of many uh, government bureaucracy, right? Um, and the last um, uh, barrier is the lack of da data to measure the scale of medical tourism. So the Philippines doesn't have um, a repository, like a, a, a reliable rep rep repository of medical tourism, unlike in, medical, unlike in other countries in the region, like uh, Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore, right? Next slide, please. Okay, um, so now let's go to mode three or commercial presence. So these, again, uh, mode three is commercial presence or foreign direct investments. So um, in 2019, human health activities only accounts for like less than 1% of total foreign investment. So, I mean, um, FDI related to health is very, very low in the Philippines around 1%. So in 2019, total in, Total in 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 2019, 10 percent of investments in the health sector are foreign in origin, and 90 percent are domestic. Right. Um, however, due to pandemic, um, um, domestic and foreign investments in human health have sharply declined. Right. So, um, investment in health sector declined from around three billion pesos in 2019 to around uh, 2.5 million in 2020. So, a 21 percent decline. Um, um, uh, 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 21 percent decline right? next next slide um I, I think it's also important to um in, in the paper we've also tried to um include some of the lessons learned um on foreign direct investments in other countries and in the philippines so there are actually lessons learned that we can actually you know um, um assimilate so there are preceded both a national and international experience in the use of fdi to improve um access right so um, number one is the expansion of hospital services um, is one of the areas that in which FDI could directly affect the provision of healthcare services. 
an example to this is um asian hospitals and um and um and international um um, um uh, corporation um, um investing in, in domestic um hospitals like um I, I think there are also experiences for example metro pacific hospitals um, um the owners of makati med etc um they have we have, have lessons to learn um in 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 attracting foreign direct investment. So there are also nice experiences in Thailand and in India in accepting um, foreign direct investments in hospital to improve um, access, right? Um, um, so next slide, please. These are some some of the barriers under mode three, right, uh, that we've identified. So number one is foreign ownership restriction, which is actually a major challenge in promoting uh, for investments, particularly in the hospital sector. So foreign ownership in, in health faci facilities is limited only to a maximum of 40% of the equity capital, right? Um, but there is actually 100% equity capital in special uh, uh, economic zone registered medical tourism, right? Um, and for manufacturing, 100% equity capital. Uh, for distribution and manufacturing of medical goods such as drugs and devices. But I think one of the most uh, critical thing here is the, the some of the restrictions in 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 ownership for health facilities, which is only forty percent. So, so that's one of the barriers that we've identified. Second is inequity concerns leading to poor uh, political and uh, ad advocacy support. Right. So a lot of decision makers also think that um, foreign direct investments in hospitals could lead to um, um, inequities. Um, um, it can also lead to um, uh, uh, dual health systems, which is like uh, mostly a health efficient, clean scheming, and and more technology centric. It is more and more expensive. And the last barrier is bureaucratic issues and some issues related to doing business. It's it's actually a a, a, a very important barrier that keeps repeating in many interviews. So next slide, please. So here. Um, um, I think we're now in mode four. Um, this is basically the mobility of health workers. So I think everyone knows this. The Philippines is recognized to be one of the highest export of, of workforce. Um, it, it's really hard to get data on on um, the mobility of health workers within the region because of the lack of data um, in, in the ASEAN regions. We don't know um, how how many health workers are going to Singapore, Malaysia, and how many health workers are coming to the country, etc. So I, I think what we um, um, what we, we try to look at individual countries, for example, like Singapore, um, and I think most of their health workers, foreign health workers, are Filipinos. So this is actually the data that we can actually find um, um, uh, uh, within the region. But other than that, we can we don't know the extent of mobility of health workers within the region. Right. Um, next slide. Uh, no, this is just a figure showing you that um, the most uh, showing that the Philippines um, is a major export of health workers uh, for both doctors and nurses. Next slide, please. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so, so these are, um, um, in addition to mobility of health workers, I think one important component of this mode is uh, the mobility of, of training or, 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 training or skill set right so so there are existing mechanisms within the region to increase capacity and technical skills of health leaders through knowledge sharing platforms so i think in the paper we've discussed some um, um, training uh, collaborations within the region such as the field epidemiology tra training network in asean there is also health technology assessment capacity um, 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 and there are also um, um, training capacity or uh, sharing of, 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 of skills with regards to the implementing, implementation of UHC and health financing. Thailand and Singapore are typically providing um, best practices to other countries like the Philippines, etc. But some of these are, are, are very loosely uh, conducted, but there are existing mechanisms um, in place in the region, right? Next slide, please. Um, so these are some of the barriers under mode four. Um, mobility of health workers are commonly um, is um, um, or interregional mobility of health work workforce is very very negligible in in the ASEAN region. 
because of so many concerns like inequity concerns, occupational protectionism, variable recognition of health professional across ASEAN state, a weak institutional capacity of many government agencies in the Philippines like um, DOH or PRC implementing MRAs, right? Um, and the lack of incentive to move, which is also a very important uh, barrier, it's like lack of social protection in, in, in the receiving country, language barrier, and cultural diversity. So these are all discussed in the paper. Uh, next slide, please. I'll try to be very quick. So some of the recommendations in the paper, I'll, I will not go through them, um, um, but number one, um, to strengthen implementation of digital health services and health governance structures domestically. First, then, you know, we strengthen it at the regional collaboration and digital health efforts, um, including digital trade. Second is to facilitate foreign direct investments um, in the hospital sector. Um, third is to develop in a well-implemented um, and well-thought medical tourism program and to strengthen cross-border mo uh, mobility of health human resources. Next slide, please. Um, we've, so we've identified some of, of the mechanism on how to do this, right? Um, for example, number one, strengthen implementation of digital health strategies and health governance structure. So number one, the e-health system and service bill should be supported by the Congress to support as the regulatory framework and institutionalist telemedicine domestically. Second is service delivery reform should be explored to facilitate integration and coordination of health facilities. Third is interoperability of EMRs domestically should be enabled. Health financing reforms for telemedicine should be facilita facilitated. Fifth is making telemedicine and electronic medical rec uh, um, EMR as a norm among healthcare providers. Right? And six is to re is to revisit pri uh, privacy laws. Next next slide, please. Um, these are some also specific some of the specific recommendations under FDI um, is to increase equity capital threshold for hospital foreign investments. Um, I think the Department of Health is now trying to um, explore these recommendations. Uh, number one, increase equity capital threshold for foreign investments. Um, impose additional tax breaks for hospital investments, um, accelerate um, investment approvals. Fourth is implementation of genuine health financing reforms. So as I've said a while ago, these recommendations are currently being considered because the release of the health facility development plan, they've realized that they need the private sector to actually fill the huge uh, infrastructure gap. So one of the mechanism is to attract FDIs and some of these um, recommendations are be currently being explored if it will facilitate the, the, the um, I mean facilitate attraction of foreign investments. Um, lastly, um, so development and, and implementation of a well thought medical tourism program. So number one is to update and amend regulations and framework for medical tourism. I think now we have we have yet to update our existing medical tourism stra strategy. Um, number two is similar to Thailand and Singapore is to identify a niche in medical tourism, right? That complements actually UHC. For instance, um, 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 examining whether wellness center, aging, and retirement home as a possible um, um, niche market for medical tourism. I think this one, this again, is being currently explored in the Department of Health. The last one is to use tax revenues, for example, from medical tourism to finance the implementation of universal health coverage. Right. So some of these are um, 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 some of the uh, policy actions that can be implemented to actually align um, the goals of UHC and the goals of economic integration. So, oh, thank you very much, uh, and good afternoon.